Shalini Randeria will speak about vaccines as global commons, and she will argue for the imperative of removing barriers of intellectual protection that stand in the way of COVID vaccines being produced on a large scale at affordable prices. Welcome, Shalini Randeria. to uh, speak to you. Uh, what I would like to do is to confine myself to some general remarks about the COVID crisis and its very differential effects across the globe and then address the question of vaccine inequalities, vaccine nationalism, which we saw to begin with, vaccine diplomacy, and what has been a highly uneven distribution and access to the covid 19 vaccines. So at the moment, uh, the crisis of the war against Ukraine has almost overshadowed the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. But if the COVID pandemic alerted us to anything, it did alert us to the power of the present moment to extend uncertainty everywhere and seemingly indefinitely. So I use COVID here as a shorthand, if you like, for potentially also other future pandemics and similar black swan events, which will affect every one of us around the globe. And if this crisis taught us a lesson, it is a lesson about the truly formidable effects of space-time compression in contemporary capitalism. We have been talking incessantly about acceleration, about the ways in which technological quantum leaps have made the world instantly accessible. But this interconnectedness, as the COVID crisis showed us, has also created new vulnerabilities, as we suddenly realized. We inhabit the same planet, we inhabit it at the same moment, but this same indivisible space also affects us very differently depending on our location and within the same geography, differentially according to gender, class, age, generation, ethnic belonging. The pandemic obviously proved the inherent worth of scientific research and of international cooperation. The vaccines against COVID-19 could not have been produced so quickly without the involvement of private philanthropy and of governments. And ultimately, the rapid breakthroughs which we saw were the results of decades of research carried out by hundreds of scientists in laboratories and universities funded from the public purse around the world. And yet, the pandemic also produced the most pronounced attacks on science, paradoxically, amplified through various channels ranging from social media platforms to far-right politicians and populist leaders. So for a while, it seemed that the pandemic transformed more power to experts, but it also reminded us that experts always come in plurals. And everyone became overnight, in a sense, their own epidemiologist, demonstrating both the appeal, but also the limits to technocracy. In a broader sense, what I would like to highlight as a social scientist is that COVID-19 highlighted a series of interconnected inequalities, regimes of discrimination and differential impacts associated with the ways in which societies respond to the virus. In short, it was not just a matter of public health or biomedical knowledge. It was also a matter of social justice, or should I say social injustice, with a complex and uneven political economy that we cannot turn a blind eye to. The one factor on which I would like to focus, apart from decades of forced austerity politics through structural adjustment programs forced on most of the countries of the Global South by imposed conditionalities when they took credits from the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank is that the infrastructure for public health was already poor, rendered poor by decisions to cut costs. And then came the artificial shortage of vaccines artificial because of the barriers that were erected because of intellectual property rights, patents that would have made the production of vaccines extremely expensive because of the royalties which would have, been pay, would have to be paid and the fact that the prices of vaccines were therefore extremely different whether we bought them in Europe or they were bought in Africa. So Interestingly, European vaccine prices were much lower 
than the prices of the exactly the same vaccine in Africa, sometimes by a differential of four to five times. And the fact that we had a shortage was because patents did not allow the production of vaccines on the large scale that vaccines could have been produced had they been treated as global commons. The knowledge behind the patents, uh, the vaccines had been treated as global commons and vaccines had been global public goods. The last point that I would like to make is therefore we really need to look at the efforts which were made but which did not come to fruition to do away for the duration of the pandemic with the patent barriers. South Africa, India, etc. went to the World Trade Organization, the WTO, asking for patent rights to be kept in abeyance. And United States, surprisingly, the government of the United States agreed to this. European governments, especially the German, uh, but other European countries too, did not play ball. So while most of us could get a fourth vaccine here in Europe, most Africans haven't got a first vaccine yet. And this, I think, leads to a crisis which we should remember about the origins of the pandemic. So pushing ahead with her research on how the mass destruction of our natural habitat, the expansion of the logic of limitless extraction, can create a world of formidable zoonotic threats from which no shareholder value will save us. this amazing, extremely um, not well talked about topic because I've been bringing that up quite a, long, um, um, a lot in my conversations. Um, um, in Germany, especially hard because of BioNTech and the celebration of the success uh, that this company had with the amazing innovations, but an extremely important topic. And I think not only on vaccines, but also on um, every single element that we need to build and construct uh, life-saving solutions we can have the same discussion because we create models of what I call an artificial scarcity uh, that makes things scarce that actually should not be scarce. But coming a bit back, we are unfortunately the audience cannot see this, but we are sitting actually uh, 100 meters from Brandenburger Tor, and Brandenburger Tor is a symbol of uh, freedom, peace, and unity. Um, and a short distance away, um, there was the wall. And the wall was here for four decades and separated uh, people based on uh, different political and social and economic systems. And the life expectancy in 1989 between Western and Eastern Germans was different. East German women lived um, 2.6 2 uh, years lower or less longer um, as Western um, Europe or German women. Uh, and with men, it was 2.4. Um, and the wall was um, as well, um, in that case, a symbol of, um, it was destroyed, a symbol of liberty, liberty, but it's for me also a warning, a warning that there are always people who want to construct walls. Walls around data, walls around AI, walls around life-saving products to make it scarce. So my first question would be, why is it so tempting for people to construct walls? What is the driver next to the economical, but from a personal and humanitarian perspective, I haven't grasped it yet. Why are there people that exclude others uh, from having access to life-saving assets? Well, a physical wall like the uh, Berlin Wall, which was dismantled uh, here just around the corner, yeah. I was in Berlin on the street watching that wall being dismantled. I was here day. too in 89. <laughs> I was here that night. And uh, so that was a wall separating two political systems. It was there to prevent uh, mobility. It was uh, there uh, to prevent people physically leaving East Germany. But the idea was that the wall would also be an ideological barrier that would keep ideas away. And that didn't work quite. Uh, but it did prevent people uh, from leaving the country. The uh, question of intellectual property protections or patents is another kind of wall. It's a legal wall. It's not a physical uh, wall. It's a legal barrier which commodifies and privatizes uh, certain 
uh, goods, certain knowledge, by making sure that somebody reaps profits from it. So it has a different logic, uh, uh, legal barrier to uh, something which could be a global commons. But uh, in a sense, it, this is a, it's also interesting as a historical question because uh, you often in the case of natural resources, you first had the commons and then you built walls around them. Mm -hmm. So that what you had were forests or uh, pasture lands or uh, agricultural lands, which were common property. And then you had the so-called enclosures, which uh, physically uh, put limits around them, turning what was common property into a private good. Thank you. It's about exclusion. Yeah, and, and, and it's, a, it's a very good analogy in uh, how the roots of Silicon Valley were founded on a city founded by um, gold miners that um, also um, um, appropriated territory and it was the more capital you had, the more guards you could buy to protect your land. And the more land you had, uh, the more gold you could dig. And in that analogy, uh, you see the same thing with data. The more capital you have, the more data you can acquire today. So um, that's the fight we are getting to, and 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 we will talk about this later. But um, there is a, this weird because you mentioned profits and that people do this for profits. But I believe, and I and I've seen examples. I've been looking for examples that openness can lead to higher profits in a sense. Even they are more distributed, and there's um. A very good example of this, um, the last century, at the end of last century, there was the Human Genome Project, and it was an open source project between thousands of scientists working together, sharing on a daily basis their scientific results. And there was a company, a biotech company at the time, which was on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange, that actually started doing similar, and they were acquiring people out of the project, and they were patenting the human genome. So they they were speeding up because it's like we want to patent the human genome and within the um, um, human genome project there was a, a researcher called john stolston who actually um, got the nobel prize later um, he kind of enforced or um, not enforced but convinced politicians and political leadership to not allow the human genome to be patented. And uh, in a joint statement by Bill Clinton and Tony Blair in 2000, they said like the common property of the human genome should be used freely for the common good of the whole human race. And it created um, a $1 trillion value creation. And, and it's the only technology, I've, if you look at all the technologies in healthcare, most of them get more expensive, not because they get more effective, they just get more expensive because the companies probably need to grow. But genome sequencing is the only technology that has followed what we call more slow, like the, it, it is doubling in its uh, capacity every 12 to 24 months, it even went faster. And we came from $2 billion for one human genome sequencing now today to 100. And I believe this is because it was open. So. If you sell, like, profits are the driver, but we can prove that um, uh, the global order, the, the whole economy um, grows faster. Why today I hear then Ursula von der Leyen talk that we need uh, to tap into the gold mine from data in Europe to drive our data economy in healthcare. This completely opposes Tony Blair and Bill Clinton's statement. Is political leadership that hard that you don't want to look at the whole picture or what what is why do we see these differences in 20 years time so this is very interesting so i don't know uh, the exact background to her statement but this is a very american view of mm -hmm. uh, data it's about uh, the fact that uh, data is capital that um, uh, data can uh, be mined for uh, profit and that uh, there should be no state regulations on it. And I think the uh, beginning, the original sin on data, if you like, was uh, the failure of the U.S. government to adequately regulate this. Hmm. It was a new... Um, 
idea. It was an abstraction. You needed to create new legal instruments in order to regulate it. The older ones wouldn't quite apply. And the fact that the, in the early um, uh, decades, the U.S. government failed to regulate it, and this is a very, uh, you know, uh, American view of uh, the fact that it should be commercialized, it should be mined for um, uh, profit, is the view that then uh, really globalized and uh, not much was done against it. And then you had suddenly, over the years, companies which were so powerful that uh, they were then <coughs> to uh, prevent any regulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that that's what I've been opposing because if you want to apply the same principles of health data from... <coughs> can, can somebody bring me the water, please? Um, I was sick yesterday, though, um, 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 so I need a bit of water. But if, if you look at the US healthcare system and you compare this with the European healthcare system, <coughs> <laughs> then we use very different norms and principles. Like we have solidarity as the basis for our European healthcare systems. We have the human right that is written in Article 35 that <coughs> mentions that policies the European Commission or the commissioners or the council brings forward should always enforce this right. Like we should always enhance the right of having access to healthcare. So my question is why don't our political leadership not act on this on this right because there is like privacy has been a driver for gdpr mm. our right to access to healthcare could be a driver to go in a different direction <coughs> <coughs> It's, uh, it's hard to say why they don't do it, uh, uh, partly probably because of the pressure uh, from uh, corporations, but also what could change it is... Uh, <laughs> pressure from us as citizens, uh, pressure from below. I mean, that is how uh, the whole question, if you remember, the struggle against uh, HIV AIDS uh, patents was because of a very, very successful uh, movement in South Africa, uh, which globalized then. And this was a treatment action campaign. <laughs> the TSC, and they were able to globalize uh, uh, that demand that patents must be taken away on the HIV AIDS um, uh, vaccine uh, medicines so that they could be given at an affordable price to those in South Africa who were affected. And uh, they could be produced, of course, without patents that uh, India and Brazil were offering to produce them. <laughs> But one of the largest opponents of uh, dropping patents at that time uh, was the U.S. government. Uh, so it's always the corporations um, and the nexus of the uh, pharmaceutical uh, corporations, the big corporations, with the powerful governments um, who uh, prevented that. But there was enormous pressure from... <laughs> Uh, communities and from uh, patients and uh, uh, AIDS uh, activists, which and very well networked activists. Interestingly, on the COVID uh, uh, vaccines, we did not see that kind of global movement at all. So in the first phase, um, when the vaccines were developed, you saw uh, uh, COVID nationalism everybody wanting, you know, the, the Russian one was called Sputnik, if you remember. So it was a reminder of the uh, race uh, between the Soviet Union and the West to get to the uh, world, um, uh, uh, to get into space. The Chinese vaccine uh, was the subject of a little bit of vaccine diplomacy. China was giving out a few of those vaccines. <laughs> to uh, countries in Africa. Uh, and then there was European solidarity on the pet, uh, pet, uh, vaccine, but it remained within the EU. So the EU, in order to ensure prices which were affordable across the EU, uh, decided to uh, buy uh, in bulk and made advance purchase agreements and was able to get a relatively good deal for itself. But that's where global solidarity stopped. Health organization, and there was an effort under the name of equity, uh, global equity, to drive and um, put balance the access to uh, life saving vaccines. But, but there was very little contribution to uh, COVAX. The uh, 
uh, rich countries were not willing to uh, contribute uh, uh, the vaccines, even if theirs uh, were uh, going to uh, be thrown away because uh, uh, they had expired. There was also little um, uh, contribution in financial terms to COVAX. But I think one game changer now could be Corbivax. That is the new um, COVID uh, vaccine developed actually on quite traditional uh, uh, methods uh, using the old uh, technology of the uh, hepatitis B um, uh, vaccine developed in Texas uh, now, which is an open source vaccine. So that could certainly become a game changer. It got emergency approval in the US, uh, in, in India, in uh, December, and uh, some 30 million um, um, doses have been administered in India. We need to now see uh, how uh, quickly it can be globalized because the price differential is enormous. Pfizer costs the U.S. government uh, some $20 uh, per um, vaccine, this one $2, so it's a tenfold price differential. But interestingly, uh, Corbivax, which um, is open source, did not ha get uh, support from the uh, US public-private uh, partnership, which was paying for a lot of the mm -hmm. development of Johnson & Johnson or um, uh, some of the uh, other vaccines. So they really had to go out and get uh, financial support. Uh, and while the US public-private partnership, which was financed uh, these um, uh, other uh, commercial vaccines, uh, the um, fund that was put into it was 12 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, Corbivax uh, apparently took between five to seven million. To yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. I, I celebrated Peter Hotez and Elena Botazzi who made a, a research behind that mm -hmm. project, and um, mm -hmm. I think Texas nominated them for the Nobel Prize. They've been nominated. Uh, I do hope. The I do hope they get it. Um, uh, because it's um, a, a remarkable achievement and it, it uh, should be a wake-up call for a lot of people that with 7 million we can achieve this open source solution versus, as you yeah. mentioned, the billions. Now, because it'll be much better access, it mm -hmm. uh, redresses the uh, uh, gradient of inequality in distribution, it's affordable, but it's also very easy to make and interestingly, it also only needs simple refrigeration, so it's very much easier also to store. Mm -hmm. Now, coming a bit more to a, a, a difficult topic to discuss because it's not been um, uh, discussed openly in, in many cases, but what I discovered on my path where we try to liberate data and AI, which will be uh, part of the building blocks for future solutions, um, and also the experience with AstraZeneca, it also got an, an, a non-profit, like they made a, a pledge to sell the AstraZeneca, um, I think, but like it was 1.5 euros in the European Union price list versus the 25, so it was much cheaper. Um, do governments really have interest to push um, um, drugs and, and products that don't make profit, like that have less profit, because profit means that you can tax profit, that you create an economy. Um, um, and from my discussions um, that I had with uh, governments in different countries, I feel that compared to the data economy, where we create um, an economy by just selling data but not creating products, <coughs> I seem there was a huge short-term interest from the governments for this wealth creation or um, in this or economic creation, the creation of economical wealth, is 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 that a fact that creating <coughs> excuse me profits is a driver for policies? Certainly, I mean that is the logic of. Uh, <coughs> capitalist production and if you have uh, uh, governments which are um, for all ideologies of uh, neoliberalism and the fact that the market should really have the last say and government should be actually taking the back seat. <laughs> What we have seen in all uh, rich countries is enormous government support for uh, all of its own uh, private uh, industry. So there's been enormous protectionism despite all talk of dropping all barriers to protection. So, I mean, there is a subsidy on agriculture in uh, Europe, uh, which is 1 billion uh, euros a day. 
I mean, no, no, no country in Africa, no farmer in uh, South Asia can ever compete on such an agricultural market. It's a totally protected agricultural market. So it's the U.S. market. So governments are protecting their own markets with barriers. Patent is only one barrier. In the case of agriculture, it's quantitative restrictions, uh, QRs, which are protecting um, uh, goods from coming into uh, the uh, EU. So there is a, a, a profit motive, but there is also a nationalist reflex. In the European case, it's not nationalist, it's uh, EU. Uh, reflex, but uh, the U.S. government has been protecting uh, U.S. Uh, industry interests right from the word go. So the way in which the rules of the TRIPS, the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights, were written for the WTO was a major protection for Hollywood, for U.S. pharmaceutical industries. Uh, so you've you've seen that connection in uh, in the very way in which the intellectual property rules are written. And, and now I come from the software industry. I spent 20 years of my life in, in, in software, big tech companies, and uh, certainly changed um, completely my, my, my future trajectory. But software has been... <clears throat> something that was totally proprietary like 40 years ago, like it was owned by the companies, it was closed and, and there was no openness in the source code. And then Richard Stallman from MIT AI Labs in 1984 wrote the GNU Manifesto and started this open software and free movement of software. And um, most people might not realize this, but software is most probably the software code, not the software itself, but software code, learning to code, is probably the most democratized asset out of the latest industrial phase because we don't protect um, the way how to write. You can uh, go and look into libraries, take software code, expand it. And it's, it's, it's a really good example if you don't create IP because you cannot create IP on the software code. It was a huge discussion mm -hmm. in that sense. You can create soft IP on methods, but not on, on um, the on code. The product uh, yeah. itself, which is not uh, true of uh, biogenetic substances, yeah. by the way. They dropped it. The US allowed uh, and pushed for patents on even biogenetic substances. On, on, on the synthetic, not nature copies, like, or like, in that sense. No, yeah. no, no. If, uh, for for example, the rice which you eat, the basmati rice, oh, yeah. uh, became the property of a Texas company. It's Texamati, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sold because they did made a very minor uh, 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 variation in the. Yeah, that's that's what I meant. They made a little variation. It's still the same, but yeah. yeah. But um, the the thing what I wanted to point out is that software is is, is software code, not software as a product or as a service. Um, but software code became sort of a are common in that sense. You have, if you look at the programmer's work, somebody in India, and, and you have a mm -hmm. huge software community, that is being created because they had access to these tools, they had access to libraries, and, and the software industry is big in India. Like there mm -hmm. were many, like the CEOs of the top uh, big tech companies are mostly from India in that sense. So um, it, it, it is an example on how we can perhaps drive or create um, uh, systems where things are shared, but the value creation, the, I have nothing against profits, but I have, I have something against creating scarcity of things that would not be scarce. So um, my pipe dream is that we create all healthcare data as a common layer and all the AI as a common layer and then create competition on something what I call the experience. Like you would compete with perhaps uh, brands and, and experience, but everybody has access to the life-saving uh, formula. Yeah. And it would kind of equalize and it would create a system of exchange. It would accelerate innovation. And, and it would perhaps create much more smaller and medium enterprises instead of these global Molochs that are um, so powerful they can um, uh, win against governments in discussions or win against the power of, of the masses of the people. Is, is that a... Um, if, if now looking at data and health data, we have the right for informational self-determination. So we always mm -hmm. have to give consent. Now in the European Data Governance Act, there is mentioned that there are data trusts for data altruism. Um, and we can get 
so-called data donations. We, we, we experienced this because we were collecting breast cancer data. That's why we said, like, my boobs are not for sale as a provocation. But it created awareness that we could donate our data. And then we are now, when we have sessions today, we're working on creating new copyright license on that data that is similar to software, open source software, that tell all the software that we create is under a copyleft license. Copyleft mm -hmm. means the opposite of copyright. It means that all the derivatives out of that and the uh, duplications need to be open, open and we create an open system. Is, is that a pipe dream or do you think that we could create a global community that drives this? Well, I mean, um, I, I think it's a, a utopian uh, scenario, which I hope uh, one will be able to make into a legal uh, a reality, because I think we'll, we'll need a lot of infrastructure to be able to um, uh, do it. But what speaks against it is what we have been seeing is more and more data um, capitalization, what people have called data colonialism, the predatory extractive of, um, uh, use of uh, data uh, and the analogy is with historical uh, colonialism to make the argument uh, that uh, there was a, a whole period in which massive profits were made through both uh, colonizing uh, countries, but also appropriating, expropriating uh, natural resources, mineral wealth, timber, land, but also bodies of uh, people, so slavery. So I think the whole analogy of um, whether we will have that predatory, extractive kind of uh, data colonialism, or we will have um, your vision of an open uh, global commons of data, this, the, I think the jury is out. But what we need to do, I think, is to work towards that, uh, especially for health data, uh, because we, what we saw in the uh, COVID case is, uh, you know, Israel, uh, for example, was the, one of the first countries to get the vaccines, but in return gave complete health population data, made it over to the company. Yeah, and, and but that activated quite a lot of politicians to create the same system as Israel had. It um, it, it opposes the um, orig or origins of the vaccine because it was a, a Chinese virologist who published the sequence COVID code on a platform mm -hmm. called virology.org mm -hmm. on the 10th of January. And only two weeks later, Moderna had the first candidate. So it was openness that actually led Absolutely. to that fast development. And it was openness from... You can call this now a deal, but it was openness from Israel to give access to the data. But if you now see the discussions around um, getting access to um, uh, databases of the clinical trials that have been made, or if you ask data back from these corporates, mm. you don't get anything. No. Like, you don't, it's, it's an appropriation. And they ask us now in the European data space to, as society to give access to data. And... My goal is to push so far as a as a as a community to say like, well, that is fine, but let us have the option that I give my data to an organization that protects my data with a copyleft license. So everybody, I'm not against innovation. I think data should be much more flowing. Mm -hmm. But I, the danger of creating and accelerating what we call uh, information asymmetries is an economical concept mm -hmm. that will be the base of unseen inequalities for my case. We will see um, uh, similarities that we now see in the classic drug development in the digital world if we don't watch out, if we don't let data flow. And and I, I think this is totally naive from, because you can prove it so much that 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 naive from, from leaders, and that was my point before, to tell them to the uh, society that the European health data space will accelerate the common data space and it will be a democratic agenda. I see this as a total opposite what's happening. Unless we make sure that it becomes one, because, you know, just when you mentioned uh, uh, the point, and to come back to it, uh, the question of the way drugs are uh, being produced. So most of the drug testing is done on so-called naive populations, which means you need people who don't have that particular disease. So you want to 
test a new drug for high blood pressure, you will go and test it in India or in um, um, uh, somewhere in Africa, but not on middle class people like myself, because, you know, if I have high blood pressure, I've already taken high blood pressure medicine. So you will go and test it on the poor in India or in Africa or Latin America who don't, who have not had access to the medicines, right? So the exact people on whom we are testing those drugs, all the clinical trials are done, are the ones who will never get to see the drug after it's developed because it's priced out of anything affordable it, to them. It reminds me of, uh, I was on a conference, the AI for Good conference in Geneva, and there was a, a company from Palo Alto, one of the biggest uh, companies in search, everything, everybody knows them, was telling about how they were in India now doing ophthalmologic screening for blindness and selling this as a SDG3 uh, um, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goal. And I asked and I stood up and I asked like the data that you extract, like first of all, did you ask for consent? Then the data extracted was made available in India and was the AI model trained on the data open? Well, <laughs> I got three negative answers. So they were doing an, an experiment, a non-consensual experiment with the poorest part of the population and they were extracting exactly that what could create value in the economy, they were extracting this yeah. and already creating the dependencies. And uh, Nick Aldry is one of our advisors, Professor Nick Aldry from London School of Economics as well, uh, coined this also as data colonialism and I stood up and I uh, um, <laughs> I asked, like, is this not a form of data colonialism? Um, I wasn't really welcome with these kind of comments because they, there was this selective blindness and it's being sold on the SDG tree. Now, I want to, as the last question, address these SDGs because it's going to be a huge driver for investments. And SDG tree is healthcare. So, but I... I think if you don't connect SDG 3 with SDG 10 and 11, economical wealth creation, social step, like all these other SDGs, if you don't interconnect them, these SDGs are totally worthless. I think you're right. We will really need to. But the question is, how will we get there? And I really think we will need a lot more public awareness of what is happening to the health data, how it's being privatized, how is it being extracted, how is it being commercialized and used. And uh, once we create that awareness, I very much hope that we are able to then have a, a campaign which really has to become a global campaign for making that data into commons with open source without the barriers of all kinds of restrictions that we've been discussing. And I think that today we have on our agenda quite a lot of these discussions of what we discussed today. We're going to talk about licensing with the world leaders that are trying to create new licenses for data, new licenses for AI. We're on the search. We're on the search for bringing solidarity into the digital age to create community and really make this happen because I really truly believe that we as a global community all together can get there. It, it's similar as software. I don't see any reason why we cannot unite um, based on the shared purpose and, and create a common layer for data and AI. And if we do this, I think um, our, our organization is called after Hippocrates. I think we will have a more peaceful uh, planet because Hippocrates in his book, um, one of his books was uh, Earth, Waters and Places, wrote that the um, societies that have unequal access to healthcare are societies that are unstable and mechanical. And I think healthcare in, in that sense is for me something that should be accessible to all and should be adoptable to the local social cultural context. And that means you need the artifacts, you need the building blocks. It's like, I sometimes call it like the letters of the alphabet to write books. And so you need everybody giving the ability to write their own life-saving stories um, um, in, in, in an analogy, um, and, but then you need access to the letters and the, and the tools. And I have the feeling that today we live in a world if Gutenberg would invent his printing press that his investor would say like, let's patent the printed alphabet. And every time somebody's writing a book, you're gonna earn so much money. Well, the enlightenment probably would never have happened. We probably would have not seen Luther's Bible and we would have been stuck in feudalism. And I think that's a warning call that um, um, if we don't do this, uh, we, we, we talk about tech feudalism today, 
that we end up more in an age that looks like the medieval times or the dark uh, times, um, um, the dark ages. And they were dark because knowledge was not available and in that sense. And it was, I think, the period where, from a Western perspective, sorry, I like, have to always watch out, from a Western perspective, there was no acceleration in knowledge. So um, I hope we, I'm, I'm very thankful that you came here on this very short notice. We uh, decided eight weeks ago to, to set up this event, but we're trying to do this, what you said, like we're going to create awareness, we're creating a global community. And the amazing thing, we found so many people that want to go willing the to same work way. With you. Um, and um, yeah, perhaps a few last words from your side. Um, no, all the best for this endeavor, because I really think uh, what we were missing under COVID was the global solidarity. And since it was a pandemic, it was a global pandemic, one would have expected at least, on the one question of uh, vaccine uh, access and affordability and patents, one would have got global solidarity. And that's exactly what we did not see. So I very much hope that the, the inequalities which were further, so it's not as if COVID created inequalities, but it deepened all the existing inequalities of class, race, gender, ethnicity, age, etc., generation. So all these inequalities which have become so visible because of the last two years of the pandemic that I very much hope the awareness which is needed for the work that you are doing has already been created a little bit and then you can work to build it further to get to a much larger um, movement of people working together to build these commons. Yeah, talking about building, we don't want to build walls, we want to destroy them. I live in Berlin, I always say like we don't like walls in Berlin. So uh, let's collaborate and uh, unite under the shared purpose of equality and let's um, target uh, in my keynote before uh, I called inequality the Death Star because it's a Death Star from Star Trek. Right? So, um, Death Star is the, the that destroyed the planet, and I said like this is the moment where the Russians, the Chinese, and the Europeans and the Americans will start collaborating because we have a joint enemy. And I think having a joint enemy and a shared purpose is always a good driver. And COVID could have been that, but it um, yeah, there's quite a lot of work to do still. But thank you so much for coming here. Um, I hope to see you soon again. Thank and I uh, wish you a good trip back to, to Vienna today. Thank and you. yeah, all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.